welcome to this year's first public global R&D. Um, I'm Andronicus, I'm an engineering manager here in Definity. I will be your host for the evening. And uh, we have for the first public global R&D of the year, we have a very exciting agenda. Um, we have uh, some great updates, um, a feature review by Manu, and then loads of demos. Um, so yeah, let's let's get started with uh, Yeji. Thank you, Andrew Nikos. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, this is Yeji from the Growth Team. Um, today, I wanted to share with you a hackathon that's been rolling since a few weeks back. Um, so on January 16th, we launched this ICP0 to DAP hackathon, and we introduced the very first official ETH integration track to encourage DAPs to explore more possibilities on cross-chain with ICP uh, through, the, through this event. And so far, we have more than uh, 600 devs joining and building, and now we uh, have a couple more weeks to uh, to the deadline. So if you're still hesitating to join this hackathon, I would say we can still make um, awesome things to happen in those two weeks. But also, other hackathons are in the pipeline for this quarter. So please follow us at Definity Dev on X uh, for the news, and do not forget to join our YouTube channel uh, for workshop recordings and other useful sessions that could help you prepare yourself for the next hackathon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yeji. Uh, very impressive sign up uh, uh, numbers there. Next is uh, Kyle that's gonna walk us through the Electric Capital Report. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so the Electric Capital Report is um, pretty much the industry standard on developer uh, reporting. Um, so they came out a couple weeks ago with their 2023 report. And just to kind of highlight a few things. First of all, you can see on these two uh, charts, I want to just say in terms of the industry, what happened is we saw uh, developer growth fall off by 24%. That's the first time our industry has seen any significant decline in developers. Um, so this is kind of a new um, phase, I guess you might say, for our industry. And then if you like dive into the data on that chart on the right, they break it down by how long developers have been in, in crypto. Uh, and you can see the biggest decline, uh, actually the, almost the entirety of the decline is caused by newcomers. So Essentially, people who had just came into crypto in like 2022 or even early 2023 were the biggest drop-offs. For ICP specifically, what that means is we should expect there to be, um, with a smaller pool of newcomers coming into the industry, that there's probably going to be more competition for those newcomers. Um, and so we should probably be mindful of that. If we go to the next slide, let's, let's look at the awesome, there's two, actually there was multiple really good slides within the report. Um, and I wanted to highlight two of them. So first of all, Electric Capital uh, decided to do this review of the last four years and which chains saw the most growth in the last four years. Now, mind you, ICP four years ago was still in um, development. So, you know, we didn't launch. We've only been around for two and a half years. But uh, so maybe maybe having a small denominator actually helps in this case. But either way, we finished fifth overall for monthly developers. Uh, you can see the company we keep that were right on top of Solana, Arbitron, near um so i think we're we're got we've got good company around us and 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 we're right on top i think that's very positive and then the same story for specifically full-time developers uh, so these were two really good money slides for us um if we go to the next slide so uh, these are i want to just kind of compare and contrast it when you actually dive into the data um Electric Capital did a lot of interesting subsetting. Uh, so first of all, they did a lot of data from Q4 2022 to Q4 2023. I don't know why they decided to focus just on Q4. And they also started breaking down things by single chain and multi-chain, which was also new for their report. I don't know if this is just because they want to tell a certain story and that subsetting helped tell that story or whether or not they're trying to keep all the chains on their toes so people don't game the system. Uh, which also could be because the next slides I'm going to talk about how we can game the system uh, based on these uh, two things. But um, first, I just want to point out in terms of full-time developers, we saw that minus 9%. Again, uh, in the context of our peers, that actually was um, on the stronger side of, of things. Um, 
you can't really see it very well in the picture. I apologize, but uh, we're we're actually um, performing pretty well on full time deaths, given the context of uh, the the landscape. And then when they broke it down to the single chain, that's when it, it ICP really popped. You can see we had a 64% gain over the year. Um, so that was that's kind of like the headline that we would obviously want to lead with in, in the public. Uh, if we go to the next slide, I want to talk about a couple aspects. Actually, let me give credit to uh, the growth team, right? Because again, in this really challenging year uh, that saw 24% of developers drop out of our eco or out of um, drop out of our industry, I think the growth team did a great job of keeping developers engaged and, and still building. Um, so Electric Capital did this multi-chain thing where they're starting to now track developers who are working on multiple chains. And I, I haven't quite, I, one of the things we want to do is obviously the internet computer multi-chain narrative is, is very strong. And so if they're going to continue to do this next year, we want to ensure the internet computer has some very strong lines on this chart. So you can see internet computers at the very bottom, orange uh, dot. Um, they didn't even connect us to Bitcoin, even though we have obviously apps that are connected that are built for both uh, Bitcoin. And so we need to figure out exactly how they're calculating this and how they're generating this chart. And we need to make sure that we're focused on um, updating our data within Electric Capital to fully reflect the fact of internet computers, uh, multi-chain nature. Um, so that's one improvement for 2024. And then the second, the next slide is a second improvement I think we should focus on, which is uh, um, all in all, if you look through the report, um, they tend to like to break things down by large chains, medium chains, small chains, and then tiny chains. ICP performs very well uh, in the middle chain, in the medium sized chain, um, but they definitely give a lot more uh, credence to the large chain, right? The Ethereum, Bitcoin, Solana. You can see um, most of the attention of the report is on that high, that that bigger chain thing. Um, I think really this needs to be the last year where we're considered a medium chain. So we really do need to beef up our um, developer, keep our developer growth going fast. So we're showing up in these these larger chain pictures, um, being compared to Polkadot, Ethereum, um, and and uh, and and the like. So. Those are probably the two areas of improvements that we can uh, have for 2024. And uh, it'll be the end of my time, I think. Feel free to Great ask any stuff. questions in the chat. Thank you, Kyle. And uh, yeah, some very positive numbers. We need all the de developers that we can get in the ecosystem. Um, next up, uh, we're going to features and uh, I'll let Manu walk us through the CKERC20 feature. Thanks, Andronikos. Hey, everybody. I'm Manu. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about an exciting new feature that uh, Definity is planning to work on called CKERC20. Um, so let's start with what that is. So as many of you know, probably um, ERC20 is a token standard on Ethereum, um, which is, I guess, similar to how we have ICRC1 in the ICP world. Um, and there are many valuable such ERC20 tokens on Ethereum. And this feature is about creating like a CK version for some of those ERC20 tokens on Ethereum, uh, similar to how we have CKPTC and CKETH uh, on the internet computer today. So um, if you're not familiar with those, what we're trying to build here is that there is some token on the internet computer, some ICRC token, um, which is like a twin to some ERC-20 token. So for example, you could imagine uh, USDC is an example of such an ERC-20 token on Ethereum. And now you can imagine that we have CK USDC on the internet computer. And this would be uh, what we call like a twin to USDC, meaning that um, uh, it's fully backed by real USDC on Ethereum mainnet, and that USDC is held by a canister. So it's all decentralized, no, no central parties involved. Um, and anybody can convert between USDC and CKUSDC and, and, and the other way around. So such that you know that if you have CKUSDC, you can always redeem it for native uh, USDC. Um, and we think that that is useful for different reasons. Uh, let me see if I can control the screen. Oh, yes, I can. Um, so we think that this is interesting for many different reasons. Um, having more having more tradable assets from uh, Ethereum also on the on the internet computer um, 
you know, brings more stuff to trade, which could give IC DeFi a boost. And in particular, there's some um, some ERC20 tokens that we think would be very valuable, namely USDC and USDT. So these are, are uh, US dollar stable coins that are very, very big. And um, a huge amount of DeFi acti activity is actually involving, you know, at least one of the two. So like the, the top uh, trading volume pools on Uniswap all involve one of the two. Um, yeah, th they really use a lot. And so if we would have CK USDC and CK USDT, we would bring these trusted stable coins into the internet computer ecosystem. Um, and then I guess a bit more abstractly, um, having all these assets from different places strengthens the position of ICP as like a hub between blockchains and the multi-chain narrative, um, which is, I think, very valuable. Um, okay, so here, I think this is the big picture, but so I, I think for the MVP scope, the starting point, the first target would then uh, be CKUSDC and CKUSDT, um, of course, preparing for more tokens to come later. Okay, then let's now dive a little bit into how we plan to build this. Um, and for that, let's look at CKETH, um, which is something we already have running on the computer since uh, December last year. And um, CKETH consists of uh, three canisters at the bottom that form like the ICRC ledger suite. This is just the ledger and I guess the archive that archives blocks and the index, which makes it easily accessible. But this, this, these three canisters together are kind of like one unit um, representing a ledger, like all SNS tokens have the same. Um, the magic of CK ETH happens in the CK ETH Minter canister. That CK ETH Minter canister is responsible for uh, maintaining this relation between native ETH and CK ETH. So you can send native ETH to the CK ETH Minter and then you get CK ETH in return and vice versa. If you have CK ETH, you can, uh, uh, burn it and get native ETH in return. And the CK ETH Minter does this by looking at the Ethereum network state and using a threshold ECDSA to sign transactions and all these things. Now, our plan is to um, extend this architecture. So we, we build on CK ETH and essentially the main thing is we add more of these ledger suites. So we add such a ledger suite for every supported ERC20 token. Um, so note that there's a single Minter so we think it's best to extend the responsibilities of the existing CKE Minter to now also be responsible for, for example, uh, yeah, the, the making sure that USDC and CKUSDC are tied together. This is like like a very, uh, I guess, uh, zoomed out picture, like a very high level picture. Um, there's a, a few real challenges that I'll get in a little bit uh, deeper into. And one of them is how this conversion actually works. So suppose I'm a user, I have, um, let's say, USDC on Ethereum, and I want to get CK USDC. What do I do? For this, we propose to add like a, a designated smart contract on Ethereum that is like the CK ERC20 helper smart contract that helps with deposits. And so now a user would be asked to do two steps. First, it would be asked to make an Ethereum transaction saying approve. Um, essentially indicating that this helper smart contract is allowed to take some of my, some specified amount of my USDC. This would be the first thing. And the second thing would be calling that CKRC20 helper smart contract, um, calling some function deposit, essentially saying, please take so many USDC out of my account. And I, this is my ICP principle. So I want that principle to receive the corresponding CKUSDC. And this helper smart contract will then kind of take the user's uh, USDC as specified, which works if the user did that approval beforehand. And then it will emit some event indicating that this happened, which you can think of as a, like a log message and forward these, um, these uh, USDC tokens to the um, Ethereum address of the CK ETH minter, which is controlled via threshold ECDSA. So this would be all that the user has to do. And then um, uh, everything else is, is going to be taken care of by the CK ETH minter. So the CK ETH minter will look at these events and, 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 and mint the corresponding tokens for you, um, which we think is nice because then it's easy for the user, right? The user just you know, fires off these two Ethereum transactions and then everything else will be taken care of. 
this is one direction. Um, the other direction is, is also challenging. So suppose I have CK USDC and I want to get native USDC back. The challenge here is that um, to get native USDC back, this would need to be a transaction on the Ethereum now. And these involve gas fees that need to be paid in ETH. And of course, this, the smart contract doesn't want to sponsor or anything. So the user needs to pay these fees. Um, so the question is, where does that ETH come from? And our plan is that the user could pay these fees in CK ETH. Um, so the user could, uh, so then the flow could look as follows. The user does two ICRC2 approved transactions, approving the CK ETH mentor to take some of your CK ETH and to take some of your CK USDC. And then you call the minter saying, hey, I would like to get native USDC back um, on this specified Ethereum address. And what the CK ETH minter then will then do is burn the user's CK ETH and CK USDC, which works because of the approvals that, that happened before. Um, and then like craft a transaction on Ethereum, uh, sending that USDC uh, to the user. And because we burned some of the user's CK ETH, the minter now has native ETH like freely available to, to pay for that transaction. There's a lot more detail there, but I guess I guess we won't have time to get into that. Um, but again, the user just makes these calls and then the minter will take care of everything else, which we think is, is, is a usable way to do it. Then there's one more detail I wanna, I wanna mention. Um, so as, as, as we discussed, every support the ERC20 token would have such a separate um, ICRC ledger suite, uh, because every ledger can only support one token. And we want all of this to be under NNS control. We don't want it to be centrally controlled. We think this is for everybody and should be under control of NNS. But now if we have many supported um, ERC20 tokens, uh, this would be many, many such ledgers under NNS control. And if we now update things, there would need to be many separate proposals that everybody needs to vote on, which is inconvenient for the voters. So what we, plan to build is a separate canister called the Ledger Suite Orchestrator. Um, that canister is controlled by the, um, by the NNS route. And uh, so proposals can upgrade that canister. And then that canister in turn can upgrade all the ledgers that, that there are. Um, so now we would need one proposal to say, upgrade all these ERC-20 ledgers. And then uh, that would happen behind the scenes. So that would only require one proposal, not super many. Um, okay, this was a very, very quick overview of the um, of, of our plans. So we wrote this up on the forum as well. This QR code is a link to the forum. So any if anybody has questions or ideas or suggestions, uh, you, you can put them on the forum as well. We, we were happy with any feedback. Um, definitely our plans to ramp up the engineering effort and, and, and start building, uh, which we think will take some months at least. Um, but this is also like, a, I guess, a heads up. So if you're a developer on the IC ecosystem and you think this might be useful to you, then like think about it now, prepare so that you can be ready whenever this feature lands. Um, yeah, thanks for your attention. Thank you, Manu and team. This is great. Um, we're all looking forward to having the most secure and super stable coin transactions in, in the entire crypto system. This is truly excellent. Next up, we have demos, and uh, we are going to talk about Large Wasms by Adam. Adam, please go ahead. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm Adam. I'm a developer on the Runtime team. Uh, and this feature is basically about some protocol changes, protocol level changes that support installing canisters, which are over two megabytes in terms of their WASM size. Uh, why do we need to do this? Well, we currently have a limit of two megabytes and it's quite annoying. Um, I mean, it's fine when you're doing Hello World, but once you start building more complicated dApps, developers hit this all the time. So uh, we just uh, need to make it easy to deploy larger canisters. and. At a high level, how this works is that we've added some messages in the protocol that allow you to upload chunks of your canister one at a time and then do a final install. But you don't need to worry about any of this as a developer because DFX is now handling it all for you automatically. 
All right, next slide. So these were our previous limits. Uh, on the left, we have an example of some canister wasm, and it contains a code section as well as like read-only data and other sections like that. And uh, we had a two megabyte limit after compression on the whole thing. So it could be bigger than two megabytes, but it has to be under two megabytes when you compress it. And we also have a limit on just the code section of 10 megabytes. After it's uncompressed, the code section can't be more than 10 megabytes. Um, and this is what we previously had. Uh, next slide. And uh, so why do we have this two megabyte compression limit? Well, basically uh, an ingress message can only be two megabytes. That's a, a general limitation of the protocol. And so when you do install code, our install code message needs to contain the entire WASM source. And so it has to fit in that message. So that's all, that's where the two megabytes comes from. Uh, next slide. And after this change, what we'll have is we'll still have this 10 megabytes limit on the code section, but now the total WASM size will be allowed to be up to 100 megabytes. So it's quite a bit, uh, quite a bit larger. Um, but we still have the same 10 megabyte limit on the code section. Uh, next slide. So uh, some future work uh, will eventually allow lar larger code sections, probably. Um, but there's uh, and the reason we still have a limit on code sections is that the code needs to be compiled to native within the replica before we can execute messages. And that can take time. And if we allow arbitrarily large code sections, this could lead to very long rounds, potentially, if the compilation takes a long time. So we still need some kind of limitation there. But even with this 10 megabyte code section limit, uh, an 100, byte, 100 megabyte canister is still reasonable and would be useful in a lot of situations. For example, if you have an interpreted language, like uh, if you're using Kybra or Azel to do TypeScript or Python, you probably have a situation where the WASM code section is really just like a Python or JavaScript interpreter, and all of your Python code is in the data section, read-only data of your WebAssembly module. And so there are probably a lot of real world situations actually where you have not a giant code section, but you have a lot of uh, um, other things in your data sections. Uh, okay, next slide. Okay, yeah. So here's the, uh, I'm just gonna demo this quickly with an example canister. If you wanna follow this QR code, you can get a link to like a very simple canister that uh, is just too large to be installed by normal methods. Yeah, so this is just a, a very simple canister, and it uh, it has one method called line, which gives you back some random lines uh, of some Shakespeare, just anything in the complete works. And the reason this is, canister is a bit large is because I've embedded as raw text the complete works of Shakespeare, which is not that big, but sadly, uh, for our current size limitations on canisters, it's actually too much to uh, deploy using our our original methods. And so all this is doing is I have the full complete works embedded. I use the time to get a random number. And then I use that to pick some line from the file uh, to reply back. And if you look at the dfx.json, you can see I'm, I'm using the gzip option. So this is kind of the best, uh, previously this is the best case you could do was to gzip your canister before deploying it. And, um, so now I have DFX running in the background here, and I'm gonna do, uh, I have two separate copies of this canister, and I'm gonna try to deploy them uh, using the previous version of DFX 15.3, and uh, also do it, do it using the latest beta, and uh, we'll see the difference. Yeah, so in both, both cases, it creates the canister and then tries to do the deploy. And on the left with the older version, this is the problem we see. Uh, at the end here, it says the message byte size is larger than the maximum allowed, right? Our messages are only allowed to be two megabytes and an install code message that contains this entire canister, even when gzipped is a little bit over two megabytes. Uh, but on the right-hand side, everything just works fine. You don't have to do anything special uh, and uh, and just call it just to demonstrate that's working. 
I get some random lines. Uh, so yeah, that's how it works. You just uh, do a normal DFX deploy with uh, the latest version. Uh, okay, I think I can stop sharing now. Um, you, you can go back to the slides. Okay, uh, you can go to the next slide. So uh, as I said, DFX will take care of all this for you. If you want to uh, do something more direct yourself, these are the new management canister APIs, which have been introduced to support this. Um, so the three key ones are upload chunk, install chunk code, and clear chunk store. The upload chunk will allow you to upload a piece of your WASM code uh, to a canister. And then once you've uploaded a few of these chunks, you can do install chunked code to concatenate them all into one WASM module, which then gets installed on your canister. And then uh, these chunks get stored in a special chunk store, which uh, takes up space. So you do get charged for it. Um, but then the clear chunk store, you can free that space at the end. So you don't get charged for it at the end. Um, so uh, yeah, just some little details. Uh, the upload chunk, each chunk is allowed to be up to one megabyte and you can store up to a hundred of them uh, in a single canister. So that's where we get the hundred megabyte total limit. Um, and a note about the install chunk code. So when you send the install chunk code message, you just list the hashes of each of your chunks, which, uh, were returned each time you called the upload chunk, or you can calculate them yourself. But one interesting thing is that we allow you to install on a target canister and optionally name a separate storage canister. So if you are installing the same WASM on many canisters on the same subnet, you can upload the chunks one time to a single canister on that subnet, and then do the installs on many other canisters on that same subnet, which can maybe save you some time. and. Uh, uh, give you quicker deploys if you have one of these models where you have many, many canisters that have the same code on the same subnet. Um, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I think that's all there is to say about this. Um, uh, next slide. Yeah. Oh, uh, sorry. I meant to add something here, but anyway, uh, so yeah, just some quick thanks, uh, Bogdan for being the feature owner, Adam Spofford did all the DFX changes. Uh, Jordan last took a, a look at our beta release of DFX and actually found a bug, which was really helpful. Um, and also Thomas Mueller on the security team did the security review. So yeah, thanks to everyone else who worked on this. Thank you, Adam. It's a great feature, not only for Shakespeare lovers, but uh, for all the big dabs in the ecosystem that they face uh the you know the the size limitation really really hits us and so yeah we're we are really looking forward to it next up is sasha on trustworthy isometrics take it away sasha Thank you. Uh, so Trustworthy Isometrics is a feature that we are uh, now wrapping up. We'll close it very soon. Uh, so what are the Trustworthy Isometrics and why are they trustworthy? Uh, so what we want to do here is provide greater visibility into node performance in a trustworthy manner. What does that mean? Uh, well, the metrics themselves are not are generated mm -hmm. by by the IC itself. They're not generated or served or proxied or anything by any single intermediary, which means that no single node can fake their own or the metrics of other nodes. Uh, so all the metrics are signed by the IC uh, itself. Uh, and why do we want to do this? Uh, this seems like a lot of work for metrics. So. What we want to do is provide node providers with some reputable source of information, which is not definite, it's the IC itself, which says that their nodes are performing well or not performing well. And going forward, we want to use that to adjust node rewards based on the actual contributions of the nodes uh, to the protocol itself. 
Uh, and this is only possible if there is a, a, a source of information that cannot be disputed. If 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 that's not definitely saying, hey, your nodes are not uh, contributing to the protocol or have not been contributing to the protocol in the past. Uh, okay, so how do we want to do this? Uh, we expose time series of, of node metrics via management canister and uh, Right now, from the metrics, we have uh, a metric on, on how many blocks did the particular node create in a day. And from the nodes that, uh, from, from the blocks that the node was supposed to create, how many it failed to create. And based on these two metrics together, uh, we are able to, to deduce uh, sufficient information on the performance of a node or, or how uh, beneficial it was to the protocol. Uh, there may be more metrics in the future added, but for the time being, this is this is what we're going to start with. Next slide, please. Uh, so, how how does this work? Which which node metrics do we have uh, specifically? Uh, on the lowest level, you you have the consensus protocol in the IC, or the, sorry, the consensus layer in the IC, uh, which means that the particular node. Uh, proposes a block, and then that uh, proposed block goes through the uh, consensus communication with, with other nodes. And then when all nodes uh, notarize and finalize that block, that block gets passed over to the messaging layer or message routing layer. And then uh, it gets written, the, the, the messages get written to the replicate state and passed over to the execution for uh, for executing the actual messages from, from the block. Uh, this is very, very uh, high level uh, illustration of how things work in the IC. Next slide, please. So the change that we made uh, was to provide additional annotation on this with the node IDs. So, Instead of just saying uh, to the to the higher levels and to the users, some node proposed a block, uh, we are actually saving the node ID that did it or failed to do it. So in this case, we can say uh, node three proposed a block. It went through the consensus. All nodes agree on that. And then that gets recorded in the replicated state and uh, aggregated uh, over, over some period of time. Next slide, please. So later on, if let's say some node fails to uh, do their duty, so they fail to, to propose a block, uh, of course, nothing happened because that node is, let's say, offline or malfunctioning. Next slide, please. And, and then after some time, uh, another after a timeout, another block will take over. Sorry, another node will take over, propose a block, and say, I did it this time. And by the way, uh, node four that was supposed to do it before me failed to do it. And this information again goes through a consensus. So there is no, no way to dispute this information. Uh, so it, it just gets recorded that both node two did it the way they're supposed to do it and uh, node four failed to do it. And yes, this is, this is pretty much it. Uh, that that was the only change. This all info, all this information was already present in the consensus uh, layer, but was not available elsewhere in the in the protocol or elsewhere in the stack. Um, next slide, please. So what we did uh, in this feature was to expose this information to the to the other layers, uh, make it accessible to the management canister, and we wrote a tool that uh, goes to all subnets in the IC and from each subnet, they fetch this information, collect it and present it to the user. Of course, all this is possible to do uh, also with the uh, direct communication with the canister. This was just done for convenience for, for the end users. And all the tooling that we wrote here is open source and of course can be reviewed by uh, anyone else or they can re-implement their, their own tooling if they, if they prefer to. Right now we have the last six days worth of metrics and they can, that can change uh, at, at any time in the future. Uh, so this is all uh, considered experimental. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so let's do a demo. 
All right. So if you would click on uh, this link, it opens a, a page with the documentation that we prepare here. We will explain the same protocol and, and uh, so on, what, what we're trying to do and provide uh, detailed information on how to get the tool and how to use it. Among other things, uh, it's necessary to prepare a wallet canister because all this communication needs to be uh, trustworthy, meaning we use update calls and for update calls, one needs to pay. Uh, so unfortunately, we have to use wallet canister at the moment uh, on on uh, from the end user point uh, side, and uh, after that, there is uh, there there are some examples of command lines that one can use uh, to um, fetch this information and then store it as as a JSON document to uh, process it, process it locally. Uh, all right, and uh, we prepared the Jupyter Notebook. So this is regular JSON file. Uh, with this Jupyter Notebook, one is able to uh, just fetch this data and process it in any other way they, they want. So into the notebook itself, uh, let me just actually run it now. Uh, let's hope it works, start kernel, fetch this information. So uh, what we do here is import some, some dependencies, and then we run this tool, which will live uh, fetch the information from the IC. So it uh, creates a separate thread for every subnet, fetches the information from every subnet in parallel. Uh, hopefully that finishes soon. Yeah, uh, it's receiving responses. Then it will compact all, all data back, uh, produce a gigantic JSON document. And uh, then we do some post-processing of the data here to compose a, a nice data frame that we can do uh, analysis on. Uh, let's see here, for example, how many days do we have in this data frame or uh, it, for all these subnets, we have 59 days, plus there is a, a, the latest day that is not exposed to the user, which is 60. Uh, then uh, if we sort the values on, how many, what is the percentage of failure? So which which nodes, or what is the percentage of, of blocks that were failed by a particular node? We, we can see that some uh, nodes have zero percentage failure. So they were 100% uh, usable or, or contributing to the protocol. And some other nodes were 100% failing, which means that they're very unhealthy. And here we do uh, some of the some other more complex query. For instance, assume that the node is uh, unreliable if it failed on ten percent or, or more blocks per day. For such unreliable unreliable nodes, count the number of days on which they were unreliable. And we can see that some nodes had one such day when they were unreliable or not working properly in ten percent or more uh, of blocks. And some uh, nodes had 18 days out of 59 in which they were not uh, operating properly. Uh, here's some sanity check, for instance. Uh, give me nodes for which more than 100% of rounds were not productive. Uh, there should be none uh, present for with more than 100%. So that is okay. And here's some plots, for example. Uh, let's see. Uh, what is the reliability of such unreliable nodes over time? So on the x-axis, we have days, and on the y-axis, we have percentage of failed blocks for this particular node. And we can see that some nodes are, are going up or down over time, so there, there is no constant rate over time, and some nodes have 100% failure uh, across, uh, across all days. Uh, and of course, there is a number of a large number of nodes that have 0% uh, failure or 100% reliability, uh, but we excluded them from the from the plot up here because we, we only uh, want to have unreliable nodes in this plot. Uh, here's an additional example where we uh, take uh, some IPy widgets, which allow some interaction with the user. For instance, we have ULs, 75e node here. So let's see what UL75 
E node uh, has over time. And we can see that this node was 100% reliable up to the December 24th, and then it goes completely offline. It uh, it completely fails to operate. And if you go back to the NS proposals, you can see that uh, on December 24th, there was a hostess upgrade proposal, and that is uh, very likely what failed this node. And here's a plot of another node, um, R5 I76, which also had a similar case, but a day after. So uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. In uh, the notebook, sorry, in the documentation itself, there's also a link to a Jupyter Notebook online, which uses Google Collaboratory. Uh, if one doesn't doesn't have or doesn't want to run uh, Jupyter locally, they can just click on that, open the same notebook in, in Google Collab, and uh, they can also uh, run the same thing on Google infrastructure basically for free, make changes uh, to to this uh, notebook, uh, draw dif different plots and so on, if they prefer. Um, the only difference in that case is that they're not able to upload uh, the, the the keys themselves and to fetch the data, or actually they, they, they could do that, but uh, it would be giving Google your, your private keys. So maybe not the best idea, but it is perfectly possible. I like to thank uh, many people because uh, this was a, a very collaborative effort. It it involved a collaboration of consensus, message routing, execution, IC specification, DRE team, and uh, research team for research lead. There is also a forum post for that where we announced all of that uh, work, and there is going to be a blog blog post with it upcoming. Next up. Um, Andre will walk us through um, uh, what improving the query cache really means and what to expect. Take it away, Andre. Uh, hey, everyone. I'm Andre from the Runtime team. And yeah, today I'll be updating on the improved uh, in replica query cache. Uh, so the initial in replica query cache was released back in May last year. So this improvement is based on the insights of that initial implementation. Uh, the, prob the problem we solve is to improve the overall internet computer performance. Concretely, we are looking into the query execution latency here, or how long does it take for the internet computer to produce a query result? Uh, why to improve queries? Uh, the internet computer process more queries than updates. Uh, the usage of the internet computer is increasing, so the number of queries. And last but not least, we can cache queries, while the update should always be executed to change the state. So uh, how do we improve it? We implement in-replica transparent query cache, with, uh, which complements the boundary uh, node cache uh, and always serves up-to-date results. Uh, uh, what does it mean? Uh, the cache is transparent. It means that uh, there is no need to configure or set up anything, neither uh, on the user side or developer side. Uh, and on the next slide, please, let's see how the caches complement each other. Yeah, uh, so let's imagine a client A makes a query call to the internet computer. First, client's browser selects a nearest boundary node. Second, the boundary node picks a random replica. On step three, the replica executes the query and caches the results lo the, the result locally. Step four, the boundary node gives the result back to client A and also caches the result for one second. Now on any uh, other client nearby that boundary node, uh, any other client nearby that boundary node might be served from the, the boundary node cache. But on top of that, uh, now clients using other boundary nodes, they miss the other boundary node cache, but they might hit the in-replica query cache. Uh, another important detail here, the boundary nodes are not part of the subnet, so they don't know about the state changes. 
And uh, as far as I know, at the moment, the boundary nodes invalidate cache entries after just one second. On the other hand, in replica cache invalidates the cache entries based on the state changes. So potentially, if there are no state changes, the cache result might be valid for minutes. Uh, on the next slide, please, let's look into how we track the state changes. Uh, the query execution of the internet computer is deterministic. Having the same state balance and time as an input, we guarantee to get the same exact execution result. Uh, because balance and time change quite often, the initial query cache implementation was not that efficient. Practically speaking, the cache entries were valid just for a few seconds. So how did we improve it? Now we detect if the query execute, uh, execution never reads its balance or time. And if that's the case, we keep the cache result longer, even when the balance or time changes. Uh, now let me share my screen, please, and let's see it in action. Uh, there is an old replica version uh, with initial query cache implementation. For the sake of uh, time, I already deployed a demo canister with a long running query. Uh, the query call does a lot of work, but it never calls uh, canister, it, it never asks its balance or system time. So let's call it. Okay, it took about a second, one second to run this query. It's a, a long run query. And as a result, it retur returns the number of uh, uh, executed instructions. Now on the right, uh, on the right, uh, we have a new replica version with improved query caching. Uh, let's call the same uh, long query here. Okay, it also took about one second. Uh, is it a demo effect? No, because uh, we are improving the cache. So the very first execution should always be the same on both replicas, right? So, and actually this confirms that uh, uh, there are no other unrelated changes uh, in between those two replica versions, which improves the query execution, right? So now let's try the call. Uh, now let, let's try to call this long query again on the old version. So again, it took about one second and it returned exactly, exactly the same result. Uh, now let's call it on the new version. Okay, now we see the difference, right? So uh, the query returned exactly the same result, but it took just a few milliseconds. Uh, so what happened? The new replica version detected that our long running query never reads balance or time. And now it keeps the cached result despite the canister balance and system time changes. So we can try to run this query again a few times on the old version. It seems like always takes about a second to run. And on the new version, it takes just a couple of milliseconds. Yeah, and that basically concludes my demo. So here is the query cache hit ratio graph uh, results. We are discussing results. Uh, cache hit ratio is a percentage of queries served from the cache without actually executing them. So the bigger, the better here on, on those graphs. It's an average across all the subnets on the internet computer. On the left, it's a graph from three months ago with the initial cache implementation. On the right, it's a graph from a few days ago with the improved query cache. As we can see, the query cache hit ratio has improved from around 10% to about 50%. It means that about half of the queries on the internet computer are served from the cache now. Uh, and on the next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so here's our target metric, query execution latency, or how long does it take for the internet computer to produce a query result? Uh, so in this graph, the smaller, the better. It's a median across all the internet computer subnets. Median is also called 50 this percentile, uh, it's, uh, it shows how long does it take to produce the query result for 50% of the queries. So the median query latency improved from 1.2 milliseconds down to 0.4 milliseconds. It means that half of the queries are served in 0.4 milliseconds or better. 
why this new graph sometimes drops down to almost zero when the cash hit ratio goes about 50 percent and it goes as we saw previously it means that half of the queries are served from the cash and serving from the cash is almost free that's why the graph sometimes drops almost to zero and the final slide please uh, the improved query cache is available, available everywhere. Uh, no changes, no configuration is needed, just enjoy it. Uh, there is a QR code with a link to a blog post if you're interested in more details. And as always, many thanks to everyone involved. Thanks a lot, folks. We did it together. Thank you, Andre. Um, yeah, while 50% uh, of the queries uh, so the increase, you might find that 100% of the people uh, love faster query calls. So yeah, thanks again to you and the team. Next up, um, our last demo um, from the Aurel network. Um, I'm really looking forward to that. Um, I'll let Ihor uh, explain what Aurel is um, and, do, and do a demo. Hello everyone, my name is Igor and uh, I'm at the core team of Orly Network and I want to show you our demo today. Uh, so firstly, in few words, Orly Network is a, uh, is a fully on-chain uh, configurable Oracle solution. And uh, here's our agenda. Yeah, let's start. Uh, so uh, Oracle, a common Oracle problem on the market is already solved by some Oracle provider. But uh, now we are in the situation uh, how it's solved by them. And uh, uh, that's why we encounter a problem that um, most of them it's, uh, rely on semi-centralized approach or, or fully centralized model. Uh, it could be very expensive if you have non-trivial problem um, and uh, really lack of uh, like big data limitation, how, how much data types you can provide to your EVM contract. Uh, so that's why we built like early network and it's firstly fully on chain. Uh, it's economically efficient because we utilize different way to consensus mechanism. Uh, instead of running up chain with uh, our own up chain with network of validator, we utilize ACP consensus. It makes it uh, tens of times cheaper than other Oracle providers. Uh, we are pro we uh, we making like modular and flexible approach to make possibility to project so for projects uh, uh, utilize different module in different composition of them to create different data uh, different custom data streams that they need for their like um, to to fulfill their problems uh, and uh, also we provide custom data feeds it's our, one of our main point. Uh, mod, uh, like why now? Uh, because modern application, I need to follow, need to have like more complex business logic, and that's why they have uh, to rely more on real world data for some reasons. For it depends on what they project build. Uh, that's why uh, they they mostly want to have um, some customizable solution uh, to be able like uh, to be able to build their like to fulfill their own needs that they have right now on the market uh, and cost efficient and fully digitalized. Uh, we've made some interview to, for some of the digitalized applications and realized that uh, our uh, hypothesis about uh, which you mentioned before is right. And uh, uh, it's a common situation when new projects start to research Oracle providers and realize that uh, nobody can fit their problem. And that's why they start building their own centralized solution. Uh, firstly, it could happen because of expensive uh, expensiveness, because of incompatibility or lack of uh, different data types provision. But when they build uh, their own centralized solution for that, we appear in the problem that um, uh, it's uh, like, not trustless approach. Uh, it, they need to distract the development team from the main focus. It also costly and uh, they need to maintain it. And uh, here could be a problem, one point of failure. Uh, that's why we want to like uh, to provide them a, pot a potentially uh, alternative uh, and uh, to make them no sense to build their own uh, off-chain service because we can do it like in less in cheaper than they build centralized solution for themselves. 
uh, we utilize such a powerful feature of ICP. Uh, without those feature, our product couldn't be uh, like up and running in fully decentralized manner. It's ECDCA threshold. We utilize that for uh, for providing proofs of uh, validity of data that exactly our canister signed some data. Also for signing a transaction and send to EVM chains, HTTP outcalls help us to fetch data from different data source and uh, to send different transactions to RPC providers to EVM chains. Uh, also, Heartbeat system make possible our like PTA automation tool when uh, we have a, on some condition frequency basis to send different transactions, and random tape mechanism uh, which uh, could help us to provide randomness on chain. It's our products overview. Uh, so we like a modular approach, and so we have different modules which. Uh, Projects could combine different ways together and uh, like reach their goals. So first of them, it's uh, CBuild, it's decentralized data feature. Uh, by default, it provides different um, price feeds, but also it uh, can be used for listing your own custom data feeds. So you, you can create your custom feed and provide different sources from where it should be fetched and some other configurations. Then you can utilize Pitya or Apollo to automate uh, delivering this data you already listed on CBU to your uh, smart contract on any VM chain or uh, on request-based mechanism, you can request uh, our contract on on uh, on chain and uh, we will fulfill uh, in callback your data that you asked. Um, also, we have other tools for in in interoperability like chain communication. It's our future tool uh, and uh, one of powerful feature is uh, um, Data pre-processing because uh, um, usually pro like different device application, DeFi project and so on, uh, wants not just providing some data from real world, they need to make some pre-processing mechanism first. And that's why when they, uh, with problem like that comes to uh, current Oracle providers, they just answer that, uh, uh, okay, we will implement it in one year, for example, and it will, it will cost a huge amount of money. That's why we want to make uh, like fully um, autom autonomous uh, uh, tool when uh, developer can provide some algorithm, it will be deployed on separate canister for him. It could be utilized as a middleware between CBU and uh, data delivery mechanisms. Uh, and you can check our QR code uh, to more arch architecture of each of module. Uh, and let's uh, let's check our demo. I recorded it. Uh, yeah, I, I need to speed up to, to, to fit time. So let's check it out. I want to show you showcase example, like project example, uh, which could like any internal application encounter problem of providing real world data to smart contract and uh, show how our network tools like uh, CBL and BTA can solve those problems. So our example is a weather auction based on weather in Lisbon and based, uh, for example, you can beat uh, what exactly exact temperature like Celsius will be in Lisbon during one day at uh, 7.15 at 5.15. Um, and if uh, you will write when our Oracle will deliver temperature in smart contract, uh, potentially you can win all the prize pool. Uh, so our this contract deployed on Arbitrum mainnet and uh, the yeah, contracts look just could look like that everybody everybody can beat just providing a special amount of uh, Ethereum. Uh, and uh, our update temperature, uh, it's when our Oracle delivers the data to contract and uh, only only executor, so only our Oracle is provides the data. And also we have a, like a close uh, auction function, uh, which also only our Oracle can call uh, to avoid some range of attack. And uh, to, um, it's it just um, executed uh, a uh, few few times before uh, winner is announced and the temperature is provided. So let's let go and show. I, I will show you how how early is solving those problems before delivering this data. So firstly, we need to have uh, we need to fetch data like about weather. Uh, so we need to go to CBU. CBU is our decentralized fetching tool, uh, and you can create a, like custom data feed. It's already created one. So we created a custom data feed which uh, have uh, some sources from where uh, like sources is like from where it should be fetched this data. So we provide uh, uh, some endpoint with the response and provide some resolver from each exactly field we need to get. In this case, it's uh, this field. And uh, three, uh, two more sources. So in total, so we have three sources from where it fetched, aggregated, uh, it making an average, and um, and then it's ready to be used by other. So second tool is Pizza and it's automation tool. Um, firstly, we have two subscription for our showcase product, uh, like weather auction product, uh, project. Um, so first subscription, once uh, in 24 hour, uh, call, like make a transaction to call close auction method in this smart contract on Arbitrum 1. Uh, and uh, 
our like canisters address permission this wallet um, makes this transaction uh, sign it and uh, send to our bitcoin one chain but firstly we need to top up execution wallet like the user who created the subscription need to top up execution wallet to um, make sure that uh, that our wallet will be able to pay us for these transactions. So it was first subscription and second subscription is already a uh, main, uh, main subscription which deliver exactly data to smart contract. So it's getting data from C build. Uh, and uh, then uh, also each uh, 24 hour provide an update temperature with those types of uh, arguments to this contract in our one chain. So each uh, time it's uh, patient data firstly and delivered data. Uh, and uh, we have like, some front end side for this example project. So um, you can you can check what uh, what the weather is now right there. You can read, for example, I would like to say that 20 uh, degree Celsius will be in Lisbon at that time, and uh, I would like to buy five tickets. <clears throat> and this is just interaction with a bit from one contract, and uh, we've made a bid. And then when uh, time is come, comes, uh, our like PTA canister is um, creating trans uh, fetching data, creating transaction, and sending transaction to our contract. And uh, the most closed bid will win all the price pool. Or if uh, it will be a lot uh, the same, exactly the same temperature, it will be spread equally uh, by them. So yeah, and also you can see you can see previous winners like who already won with uh, which bet and how much they won. Uh, and to show you how uh, in general it looks uh, like responses from our CPU, for example. So we list this uh, custom data in, and then we can fetch it. Uh, but uh, we can fetch it with a signature, like exactly our permission is called of CPU signs this data, and the signature could be treated as a proof to be verified on destination chain that the uh, data is correct and could be used. Uh, but in the sense of PTI, PTI just getting like that. Uh, so it's, when it's asking from CPU, it's fetched from all sources provided in this uh, custom data feed, and then uh, it's aggregating and respond to this data structure, and then this data structure getting um, by PTI and formalized into a transaction and then to our, like, to our destination. Uh, so in this case, just the log of winner declared after, after the data provided with, for example, from yesterday, temperature 162, but with decimal of one, so it's 16.2 degree. And uh, in this contract, uh, in this method, so it's providing uh, temperature, decimals, and timestamp, and it's already could be um, utilized by a uh, smart contract owner as uh, they want to to use it. So the bit. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, thank you. So it was our demo, uh, and you can you can go to our application by this QR code to check it out. Uh, our roadmap. Uh, we already like have up and running CPU and PTA modules uh, right now in the development stage. Apollo and Cassandra are like decentralized identification mechanism, uh, and then we will go to our preprocessing algorithm mechanism. Uh, it's our contact information, and thank you so much for your time and listening. Thank you, Ihor. Um, the this is great. Um, the ICP's answer to Chainlink. It's brilliant, and uh, you can't go wrong with uh, Greek names as product names. So thank you all for um, attending, um, and we'll see you in the next uh, public global R&D at the end of February. Bye, all.